Welcome everyone to the lecture on sustainability in design. This is going to be a lecture mostly intended for an audience of product designers, industrial designers, but basically anybody who has an interest in um, sustainability in a context of research and development. Now to begin this lecture, I usually show this slide. The thing is, we have one planet that we are working with. We currently don't have any others that we can draw resources from. And the best resources to draw from are clearly the ones that will grow back, of which we have a fair number. And they are mostly biomatter, um, things that will grow back simply, you know, wood things like that. There are also a number of resources here on this planet that are not going to grow back. Uh, we are currently merrily engaged in the process of depleting these without any particularly good ideas as to where that will end and when. Clearly I'm talking about things like gas, oil, minerals, metals, once they're out of the ground, they are in circulation here in human society. And some of them will circulate longer, some of them shorter. There are some resources that we could tap into that are of value to us, such as the sun and the wind, oceans, the currents and uh, streams and rivers. So these are things that are always going around and around, and we can use these in various ways to derive either mechanical or electrical energy from them. I think the first thing we need to clarify when we're talking about sustainability is what is sustainability? What are we saying when we are saying something is sustainable? I think it means this. If you can do something forever without harming nature, it should be sustainable as far as the planet is concerned. Right, so that was just a, a quick intro. There will be more on that later. <clears throat> How do we come in? We are designers. Why do we concern ourselves with sustainability? Again, my opinion is we do this because we are in the business of solving problems for our society. That's what we do. Designers are problem solvers. So when you employ sustainability as a designer, you are creating solutions that should work forever without harming the planet. <coughs> Let's um, take a look at the problem here, the big problem. The big problem is that we humans aren't actually entirely capable of mimicking what nature can do. Our processes are currently vastly inferior to that of nature. And here's why. So this is to serve you to understand how nature works. On the left, we have our natural resources. And the cutesy character here in the middle is going to serve us as our icon signifying nature. Now, nature and beings, animals, will always draw from natural resources. They will then create energy from them. So that is clearly something we are not really good at as humans at the moment. Nature can do it. We cannot. If we look at how nature, uh, how, how human civilization is, is uh, dealing with the natural resources, we come to a very clear picture. We draw from the natural resources as everything on this planet 
we consume and we leave this and this does not represent fuel unfortunately so what we do is we we do what we call down cycling there is a life cycle to everything and we cycle down because uh, we diminish the value of what we consume you might argue that elephant droppings also don't represent more value than the food the elephant elephant has eaten but actually they do they are very uh, useful ingredients for other steps in the natural process our garbage unfortunately though is not it doesn't connect with the rest of the natural cycle so in sustainability we are beginning to develop solutions to tackle that problem one of them is upcycling. Now, I just talked about downcycling, which means the life cycle is lived through, and then when it ends, the product is worth less than before. <clears throat> upcycling means you take something that is worth little or nothing and you create something better out of it. In the case of human waste or not human waste um, waste left behind by human civilization that could look like this you bring the bag of trash back to the pot of resources i'm not saying natural resources they're just resources now then someone usually a designer will apply magic and put it back in Then, of course, um, after that has happened, it, it will be downcycled again. So it would be nice if we could continue this cycle, but unfortunately it is in the nature of the waste that we create that it ends up being quite useless to us and anybody else uh, a few cycles in. We try cradle-to-cradle -cradle approach. You might have heard that. Cradle-to-cradle -cradle means that there is no waste, everything always gets reused totally. So if we envision a product like a child or a baby in its cradle, then when the child is no longer a child but has lived its life and dies, it becomes another child. And again, and again, and again. This is what nature does. Elephant droppings are something ants can make use of. Coke cans are not something anyone can make very good use of naturally at the moment. So if we had cradle to cradle in our society, it would have to be as easy as it is for ants to recycle or utilize elephant droppings to make use of the coke can. So cradle to cradle looks like <clears throat> you put the trash into the resource bin, you do your magic, you put it back into society, it's waste, and then you do it again. Magic go in and so on so this is <coughs> cradle to cradle right so this means you are mimicking the life cycles of nature in society in civilization we're not saying it's the same quality of uh, processes but at least we are doing it like nature There's this as well, the carbon balance model. The carbon balance model works like this. You use your natural resources in society, put them in, and then what comes out leaves a um, responsible amount of, uh, of carbon, of CO2. So 
in essence, we are saying during its life cycle, a product, a product should not be emitting more CO2 than it would take to reproduce it. So that is also a little bit like nature. It just means within its life cycle, the product isn't consuming more uh, or, or uh, creating more CO2 um, than, than absolutely necessary. We have some statistics here. You've probably all heard about the ecological footprint and you might find this interesting. Now, this isn't exact, exact data here. But to show you a bit of an example of just how unsustainable some societies are, I'm contrasting China, Europe, and the United States. And the governing philosophy here in our example should be, let's just say if everybody lived like in country or region X, how many planets would be required for that country or for, for the, the world to live like that? You may find this surprising, but if everybody lived like it is common in China, one planet would be enough for us all. So what are we saying here? Is China such a sustainable place? Hmm. You may find that some people don't agree with that, but we'll get to that. If everybody on this planet lived like Europeans, we would need two planets to draw resources from. And if everybody lived like North Americans, we would need to have four planets to draw our resources from. So you can see that there is a definite difference in lifestyles <clears throat> that has its impact. Back to this China question now. How come China seems so sustainable? How come if everybody lived like the Chinese, the Chinese, if there is such a thing, um, we would be fine as a planet? Well, the answer is in the diversity of China. There are more than, there is more than one China. <clears throat> you have this kind of China, the very metropolitan, comfortable, high energy consumption China. Cities like Beijing, Shanghai, where life really is like in America. And then you also have the other China, which is far more austere, uh, doesn't use as much energy, and this is generally um, yeah, less, less energy um, intensive. So what happens is these two extreme demographics work out to a lifestyle that seems okay for uh, the survival of the planet. But actually what we want to do is we want to find ways for the people in scenario B to live as nicely as the people in scenario A. And we want to do this without consuming as much energy as the people in scenario A here at the top right currently do. So there are some challenges ahead. There are countries that at least pledge to be carbon neutral Costa Rica, for example, has done this. They are trying to remain neutral in their, in their uh, CO2 production. Denmark is also doing this. You may argue, oh, it's probably easier to do this in a warm country, but not necessarily. Denmark is a cold country. Iceland is also trying to be carbon neutral and they're doing really well. Um, on the plus side, they have volcanoes, which really help with a lot of things, such as hot water, which is high energy um, if, um, intensity. Then you have the Maldives, which are doing this to set a sign because they are actually endangered um, by yeah, being flooded if the ocean, ocean levels rise any further. New Zealand is going for carbon neutral status. Norway, Tuvalu, another island nation that is uh, threatened by flooding. Vatican City is trying to go 
carbon neutral. The province of British Columbia, Canada. And the country of Bhutan, famous for creating the World Happiness, <laughs> sorry, the World Happiness Index. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, I found this map here fairly recent as of the date of recording this, 2017, and it shows you what the ecological footprint um, of these countries is. So you can basically say that the darker the country is portrayed, uh, the more wasteful they are. It's pretty evident that some countries here uh, which have a high lifestyle are clearly doing this at the expense um, of land use. Now let's move on here and ask ourselves why we designers should get into this and uh, how we can even do that. First of all, the thing is this, sustainability is a topic that affects engineering, management, research, prototyping, marketing, accounting, PR, all these different things. <clears throat> and we designers are among the very few professional fields that will actually be able to touch on all of them because we are generalists and we are expected to understand these. If you're looking at this graph here, I've tried to show the uh, areas of expertise that all these different professions commonly have, and you'll find that they are all um, a little restricted. I mean, you know, none of these understands all these other fields, with the exception of us designers. I'm not saying we are experts at all of this, but we know a certain amount of all that other stuff, and we have to because that's that's our business, and that is why it is logical to bring designers into this, and managers, and engineers, and marketing people. But clearly, the more of, the, the, the more of these fields you can cover, the more difference you can make. I tend to say that designers therefore have a holistic understanding of all the different areas in which sustainability comes to bear, and where sustainability relevant decisions are made. So we are actually affecting, where we designers are able to affect all the areas that are uh, touched by sustainability. You may have heard things like a company CEO saying, yeah, we're doing it this way this year because it's a little more sustainable. And that in itself, I have to tell you, is, is an invalid usage of the word because it's, not, it's, it's a bit like saying uh, somebody is a little bit pregnant. You know, you're either doing something in a sustainable way or you're not. And I'm not being extremist here. What I'm saying is uh, sustainable is a word that says that you can do something for good without ill effect. So <clears throat> if you want to bring that about, you need to do this. You need to look into how people, the planet, and profitability can benefit. Because that's really what it boils down to with sustainability. Sustainability is not about saving the whales alone, and everybody else will just stay at home and eat tofu and walk. Uh, you need to make sure that everybody's happy, Everybody has enough money and that the planet doesn't get trashed in the process. That's proper realistic with sustainability that works with sus uh, sustainable societies. There are some principles of sustainability, the Ceres principles here. Um, you can look at these on the web. I'll just quickly point them out to you that they exist. So these are the Ceres principles. It's about protecting the biosphere, using sustainable, uh, using natural resources in a sustainable way, reducing and disposing wastes, 
Definitely. Conserve energy. Reduce risk. Now, where, where does that come from? That's because we want people to be happy, remember? So um, making life less risky is also more sustainable. Safety. Make life safer. That's also sustainability. Wherever the environment has taken damage, somebody will need to do something about it. So environmental restoration is part of the series principles. The public needs to be informed, perhaps educated. That makes a big difference. Management will need to be committed to these goals, so somebody will need to brief management, train management, and somebody will need to control what's going on. There will need to be audits, there will need to be reports written, and so on. So this is all Ceres. And if that interests you, and if you want to become a bit more serious about uh, being a sustainability practitioner, um, you may want to take a good long look at these things and uh, internalize them for yourself. So, like I said before, it's not all about being good to the whales. It's about having a set of ideals that will make the world a better place and having a number of processes that help bring that about. So that everything on the planet is happy. Nature, humans and the planet itself. Now then it's proper sustainability. So the humans As I said before, um, the only thing I think we directly do for humans in um, sustainability is risk reduction and improved safety of products and services. You can do this in, and not just this, but also the other points that I've pointed out here, with all these different uh, tools, methods and approaches. I'm just um, listing these here because if you want to become a practitioner who helps instate sustainable policy in organizations, governments, corporations, uh, you may want to subscribe to one of these or several and make sure that um, perhaps they accredit you. So you could, for example, become an official practitioner of some of these and uh, that would basically give you a status as a consultant with a with a charter. I'm bringing you here some examples of sustainable design. First of all, before I launch into the examples, though, sustainable design generally means doing something forever without harming nature. We've heard that before. And we see this done by these people here, for example. Um, now, this is perhaps an extreme example, tree shaping. I'm not sure if this would hold up to uh, the requirements of cereal production, but it is a very nice concept to say, OK, if we're going to manufacture something, we're simply going to grow it that way. So these four designers here have found ways to grow trees in uh, certain shapes and that then becomes their product. You sometimes find that older civilizations have always done things in a sustainable way because doing it sustainably often means not using refined processes and uh, pr refined processes only came around fairly late in the game. So in theory, if you're looking at old stuff, it's probably sustainable. So here's a bridge <clears throat> made not only from material from the woods, but these are actually all live. So this is a bridge in India um, that is put together from, from roots that are actually still functional, still operational. 
this can keep going. This isn't just going to age and collapse, but this is somebody has uh, grown roots across the river. Fantastic. This whole idea of growing plants in certain shapes has uh, inspired other people, of course. Here we see an interesting one of uh, a house that is grown in a certain shape using trees. We have this interesting rat in car concept. And the fact is, yes, who says we need to make cars out of steel? Why couldn't they be made from stuff like this? We'll only go to a certain point, of course. But it's a, it's a fascinating thought, really. It is a little bit like um, the Flintstones car, if you remember that one. Of course. But who says that um, the level of sophistication we currently have is the only one that makes a civilization? Perhaps some things are simply a little over the top and not worth the contamination they cause. A vehicle like this, how popular is that likely going to be? Probably not very. So the profit side of sustainability needs to be in perfect shape, like I've said before. And personally, I'm actually of the opinion that you will need to have a certain amount of refinement to have profit. Because rough looking stuff is never going to fetch high prices, but it can look refined and be sustainable. And that is where we come in. There is a bit of a, an, an unwarranted romanticism at the moment about sustainable products, that they need to look rough, that they need to look uh, unrefined, and I completely disagree with that. I'm of the opinion that objects can look as refined or even more refined than they currently do, and they can still be totally uh, sustainable. We have the know-how to do this. Just as an example, here's a perfectly good uh, show car by Ford, which uh, is called the Model U, and it is actually made from plastics that were derived from soybeans. So, you know, where's the rough in that? This is a perfectly acceptable looking refined vehicle. We have other ways to be sustainable. Aluminium may be a pretty clever choice in that regard because there is a huge amount of recycled aluminium going around now and even though the initial creation process of aluminium is not exactly uh, great for the environment at all, once it has been through a few life cycles, or just one for that matter, it is there and it is easy to recycle. So if you wanted to be refined and sustainable, you could just uh, reach out and use aluminium as a designer. There are other designers out there who have um, tried to give their products a more sustainable philosophy. A very famous man here from New Zealand is David Truebridge. And he came up with these things that I think have exactly the right balance between being sustainable, looking sustainable, and actually looking attractive as well. So you look at these and you're like, yeah, these look like they're good for the environment, and actually they are. So he's, he's hit that off pretty well. Some more of his products here. And this is the man himself in a canoe, also sustainably built. Let's look at options that we designers have to design for sustainability. First option. You can design it for emotional durability with absolutely no end of the life cycle envisioned, like this object here. Do you think this was ever intended 
to be discarded. Really, I, I don't think so. This was supposed to be, this was supposed to last forever, and it can. It's a silver teapot, beautifully made, and it's not just the material, it's also how it looks, how much detail is in it, how much love has gone into it, the appeal that it emanates and um, how, how much people are going to, to treasure this. So if you build a treasure, it's probably never going to die. It's always going to be there. And that is one way to be sustainable. You build for emotional durability. Here another vehicle, <clears throat> or, or a vehicle in this case, uh, old Rolls Royce. I don't, I don't think you would just very easily scrap one of these, would you? It's, it's just too special, <coughs> too precious. So this vehicle was made with the idea in mind that probably it will never be scrapped. And when you look at statistics, Rolls Royce actually seem to lead the pack there in terms of uh, which percentage ever made is still in circulation. Uh, Rolls-Royce are among the least scrapped vehicle in the world just because you don't scrap something like that. You're, you know, you have an emotional barrier there to doing it because they're too nice, they're too precious, they're too, um, too good to be chucked out. Here another thing, an old Italian handmade clock. You wouldn't ever get rid of that, even if it doesn't work anymore. Because who cares if this works? Just the way it looks is amazing. I hear an old wooden chest from who knows which century with inlays and everything. And again, you know, the, uh, the emotion will keep this alive will keep this uh, from dying. So that was the first way in which we can design stuff. And obviously, uh, we may not have that option unless uh, you're working for a very boutique, very elite kind of manufacturer. The truth is we live in a consumerist society and we are usually in need of stuff that yeah, has a realistic short life cycle and can be replaced. So we can try to be carbon neutral about the way we make stuff. I have explained that before. And you can do that um, fairly easily. Like here we have shoes, for example, that are made in a carbon neutral way. And the ultimate proof is in the fact that these shoes are from the 18th century and they don't look very different from ours. So if they were able to make shoes with the processes they had then, and they were carbon neutral, then so are we today. And in the end, the fact is that um, if you want to be absolutely carbon neutral about everything, we may need to change our lifestyles. And there are societies here on this planet that manage to be totally carbon neutral and they're simply the societies that aren't using any any refinement of any high level to uh, create their civilizations so that is basically the story of sustainability as far as we consign uh, we designers are concerned and uh, i hope you can take some of this on board all the best in your projects